Good morning. My name is Sina Rabani, and I'm privileged to serve as the Dean and a Professor of Engineering at Fred the Matthews School of Engineering and Applied Science. It is certainly my pleasure, along with my distinguished panel members, to welcome everyone, in particular our new president, President Susan Poser, to our session on innovative experiential learning opportunities in engineering and computer science. I would like to also express my debt of gratitude to my colleagues who agreed to share their exciting work with us at our session today. At the Demata School, we are committed to creating an inclusive community, one that is enriched by initiatives that cultivate a diverse student population to solve technical problems, thereby better preparing them for becoming successful professionals. We are also dedicated to bridge the gap between education and professional life for our students and faculty to connect with successful alumni and learn firsthand from their professional experiences. We offer a variety of student-centric academic and social enrichment programs. Slide is not coming up. Well, I will tell you what's on the slide. <laughs> and social enrichment programs that feature culture development, mentoring network, and research opportunities for our students. Some of these recent initiatives, which was supposed to be on the slide, include our overseas program. This is a program that introduces a multicultural perspective by combining liberal art courses on Latin American culture with capstone design work on site in a Central or South American country. We offer our Women's Summer Program in Computing Engineering called W Spice. Again, the program focuses on, still not coming up, okay, on leadership and technical careers. This initiative is designed to alleviate gender imbalance in our profession by increasing enrollment and retention of undergraduate women students. We also offer Women in Cybersecurity Club, Society of Women Engineering. Uh, they all support and guide our students by empowering them to achieve their full potential in their chosen profession. This past January, we participated in an innovation tournament for social justice, which was co-sponsored by our law school at Hofstra and New York State Bar Association. As part of this, our students develop apps that help underrepresented and underserved population in dispute resolution. Needless to say, our students and the Hofstra Law students took place at the competition, took first place at the competition. We offer many more opportunities for students to learn outside the classroom, which not only enriches their education at the math school, but also it improves their all overall experience at Hofstra. And some of these programs include our co program, summer research program, Hofstra in Silicon Valley program, and my colleagues today will give you an overview of some of these activities. Now, the next slide I have for you. What does these initiatives all have in common? They promote creativity and innovation in engineering and computer science education. Our curriculum includes the study of real-world scenarios to enable our students to develop the ability to think and act creatively. Our students learn through active participation from day one. These opportunities expose them to develop a passion for computational thinking and problem solving. In the course of this presentation, again, we will demonstrate how these programs cultivate open-mindedness and encourage our students to innovate, hence transforming our students into leaders. Now the next question, or my final question, how does this transformation take place? The balance between tradition and innovation must reach right into pedagogy's practice in our vibrant schools and classrooms in a rapidly changing world. Tradition is incredibly important force that sta stabilizes and anchors our practices in our past. However, maintaining tradition 
cannot become a pretext to resisting change. Without innovation, we become obsolete. During the recent pandemic, we saw the role of digital innovation and how that play and keep traditions alive. Not only was teaching from K-12 to graduate school was preserved by a new tool called Zoom. Even the social fabric of our society, the ability for us to interact with our loved ones was maintained. Similarly, our experiential learning programs at the Demata School cultivate open-mindedness and encourage our students to innovate and by doing that, we are hoping to transform them to be student leaders or leaders of the future. Um, I want, at this stage, to introduce my colleague, Dr. Rich Perzer, who is the chairperson of the Department of Engineering, to come up to introduce himself and introduce the faculty members from the department who are going to be giving brief presentations each on some of these activities. Rich. Thank you, Sina. <clears throat> it is great to be a part of the symposium today and have the opportunity to talk about the great faculty and programs that we feature here in the DeMattis School. As chairperson of the engineering department, I'd like to take a moment and briefly describe the department, highlight some of our faculty research efforts, and introduce two of my faculty colleagues to you. The engineering department houses six different undergraduate engineering programs, all of which are ABET accredited. We have programs in bioengineering, civil, electrical, industrial, and mechanical engineering, as well as an engineering science program. In most universities, it takes six departments to achieve what we can do in one department here at Hopkins. We also have a master's program in engineering management, and this program is designed to improve the business and management acumen of practicing engineers and scientists working in a technical environment. Across our programs, we have nearly 500 eager and determined engineering students. Also in the engineering department, we have 12 different uh, teaching laboratories. And I stress the term teaching laboratories as all of our labs are used and available to all of our students for both coursework and research work. Accessibility uh, for our students to the engineering laboratories, and most, most especially to our engineering faculty, is the hallmark of the Hofstra engineering programs where we focus on undergraduate engineering education. Our 18 engineering faculty are all here at Hofstra because we have a passion for engineering and, most especially, a passion for teaching. We bring this energy to the classroom and laboratories every day, and, as Dean Rabani mentioned, we strive to educate our students to be problem solvers and to design solutions to improve our world. And as I like to say, the world needs more engineers, and my colleagues and I are working towards that. In addition to their passion for teaching, all of our faculty are very active in research. Listed on this slide are just some of the research areas in which our faculty are engaged, from the design of robotic medical devices and conducting work on, on experimental fluid mechanics to addressing environmental concerns, such as wastewater management. Our faculty are involved in a broad array of research work, and research in the area of improving engineering education engages many of our faculty across all of our engineering disciplines. It is especially notable that most engineering faculty actively include our undergraduate students in their research endeavors. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing two of my colleagues in the engineering department, Dr. Nick Myrna and Dr. Ted Siegel, who will talk about their research and also discuss the Mattis School-based experiential learning programs in which they have been active. Dr. Nick Murna is in his sixth year here at Hopkins. He teaches in the bioengineering program as well as in our first year engineering program. His research interests are in the broad area of tissue engineering, and Nick is a very earnest faculty member who has helped to increase the breadth of the curriculum in bioengineering. Nick has been active in both the Summer Aspire research program and the W Spice program supporting women in engineering and computer science, and he will discuss all of these programs and his research. Following Dr. Myrna will be Dr. Ted Siegel. Ted is in his seventh year here at Hofstra 
and teaches primarily in the civil engineering program. Ted's research revolves around the design of structures, including the use of unconventional materials in structural design and designing for sustainability. Ted is a gifted teacher and has led the effort for the development of our Hofstra Overseas program. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nick Kearney. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nick Myrna, and uh, this is my sixth year as Assistant Professor of Bioengineering. Uh, and today I'll be describing some of the research opportunities that are available to students in the School of Engineering and Applied Science. While at Hofstra, all of our bioengineering students uh, gain valuable skill, skill sets while working in the Cell and Tissue Engineering Laboratory in Weed Hall. Now this can come in the form of lab courses, capstone design, um, the honors thesis project, and summer research. The three bioengineering faculty who work in this lab include Dr. Rabani, who specializes in vascular biomechanics, Dr. de Guzman, who works with keratin biomaterials that have applications in bone regeneration, and myself, who has been developing plant-based uh, vascular biomaterials. Each summer, uh, undergraduate, uh, bioengineering, engineering, and computer science students uh, work closely with faculty members uh, through the uh, Advanced Summer Program in Research, or ASPIRE. Over 10 weeks, these students will perform original research that addresses real-world problems. Uh, over the last summer, I worked with a total of three students uh, on two different projects, developing plant-based uh, vascular grafts, and building a bioreactor system that can prepare these graphs for transplantation. Now, these summer projects often continue through the academic year. And while at Hofstra, the students will later present their work at national conferences and publish in peer-reviewed journals. Coronary heart disease affects millions of Americans each year. And it's often treated with bi vascular bypass surgery to reroute the blood around the blocked artery. So transplantation of a patient's saphenous vein is the most common form of treatment. Unfortunately, 20 to 30 percent of patients don't have a suitable uh, saphenous vein for transplant. So there is a clinical need for tissue engineered uh, vascular grafts that are similar to these vessels. In my first uh, Spire project, I work with undergraduate student Gianna Rinaldi on a project where we utilize decellularization, the process of removing cells, to turn these plant leaves into a suitable cellulose-based biomaterial that can be used to create vascular graft. Now, this process of using plants to create vascular grafts hasn't really been done before, so we used our previous experience decellularizing umbilical cord arteries to help optimize the strategy. Now, this process can also be very damaging to the protein structure of the scaffold. So we performed histological and mechanical assessment and actually found that uh, these scaffolds retain most of their cellulose structure and tensile strength. And in order to create a vascular graft that was also resistant to thrombosis, we would seed our decellularized scaffold with human endothelial cells, cells that normally line your blood vessels. And then we assessed the graft again after five days and found adequate cell coverage and viability. Now, in my second Aspire project, I work with undergraduate students Che Kagata and Lucia Galindo, and we designed and built a bioreactor system that could then take those grafts and prepare them for implantation. So what this system would do would introduce a fluid flow into our, into our graft, and this would simulate the type of blood flow conditions you would typically see in the body. This flow would expose the endothelial cells that we seeded onto our graft to a shear stress and also mature the vessel, and this helps prevent the cells from later detaching once we implant it into the patient. Now, a novel aspect of this project is the inclusion of a pressure waveform shown here, which would range between 80 and 120 millimeters mercury, the same pressure range you have in your, your blood. And this would help stretch the vessel in the same way that your heart stretches uh, the vessels with each beat. And this really helps promote cell 
of proliferation and migration. So I'm going to see if this video works. It may or may not. Um, here we can see uh, endothelial cells that have been seeded on a vascular uh, graft biomaterial, and we can see how they grow and naturally spread across the material. And this is what we're, we're trying to stimulate when we create the graft. Now lastly, uh, WSPICE is a five-week uh, summer program that I participated in that prepares first-year female students for career opportunities uh, by allowing them to explore different areas of engineering and computer science each week. Now in the third week of the program, I introduced these students to a variety of bioengineering problems and solutions, uh, which included long on a chip devices. And these devices are a type of microfluidic chamber that helps stimulate the conditions found in normal functioning lungs. And this requires a balance between perfusion and ventilation. And these devices are good because they're a very human relevant model uh, that can be used to study pulmonary uh, physiology, pathophysiology, and drug response. The students then during this program uh, design these devices using a modeling software uh, while applying engineering constraints. We then 3D printed the devices and then repeated this design process and improved their designs every day. And by the last day of the, the program, or the last day of the week that I met with them, uh, Jeffrey Suhu, a Hofstra alumnus and biomedical engineer at United Therapeutics, visited and he actually judged the designs and gave them some feedback to help them improve. And then he spoke to the students about different kinds of career opportunities that are available to them in the STEM field. So in summary, our undergraduate engineering computer science students have the opportunity to gain hands-on experience uh, while working closely with faculty members. And these summer programs provide uh, valuable skill sets that help prepare students to pursue careers in industry, medicine, and higher education. And as I mentioned before, uh, students reinforce these skills when they later take their lab courses, their capstone design, and their uh, honors thesis projects. So now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Siegel. Thanks, Nick, so much. I appreciate it. So I'm in my seventh year here at Hofstra, and in my first semester, I was fortunate enough to capture a major milestone on camera. I came home from work, and I found my older daughter playing on the floor, and she had finally done it. She'd put two mega blocks together. My wife and I, were, we're both structural engineers, so forget walking. Now we had a builder on our hands. Perfect. And you can all relate, because at some point, you were a child, or you played with your own children, and you built. And it was joyous. Or you broke things, and that was We can capture some of this joy at home. And we are. In the labs, outside the labs. Students are building, and they're building at a range of scales. And while it's still quite playful, it's now being informed by engineering principles. Gravity, that destroyer of so many ambitious childhood creations. What if instead of grappling with it, like structural engineers have to do every day, we can actually utilize that to help us generate interesting designs? In this photo, you see a series of plaster Paris models. Just last period, students and I were covered in plaster, making models just like the idea is that you take fabric. You immerse it in plaster of Paris, you allow it to hang. Gravity works, pulls it down into forms that are in pure tension. Tension are, is pulling force. We can then invert these forms, and now you have structures that are in pure compression. Compression is pushing. So now we have structures that could actually enclose space. These kinds of models are really powerful. You see a whole series here. All the students were given the same size fabric and told to pin the fabric at the same four corners, yet all the models are slightly different. So design is still possible despite having these constraints. This method is used by actual designers to build real structures. Usually, they're making small-scale models that inform the geometry for a large-scale structure. They're not usually taking a structure at the full scale, hanging it, and flipping it. But why not? What if we could? So in 2018, there was a call for a competition to build a pavilion for a symposium in Barcelona. And the team that I worked on was interested in reusing waste. And we focused our efforts on reclaimed acrylic. And we wanted to see, could we actually perform a full-scale flip? How crazy is this idea? And so we took the acrylic. And you can see the concept here in a rendering. 
we hung it, we allowed it to slump, we then disassembled it, and then we can take this to Spain and reinstall either hanging or flip it into that compression-only form. But here's the catch. Acrylic doesn't work like plaster of Paris. Plaster of Paris initially is wet, and then it cures and it hardens. Acrylic is rigid initially. We have to transform it, and that transformation occurs through heat. So when you heat acrylic, it passes through what's known as the glass transition temperature. It doesn't melt, it just becomes really stretchy. And so what you see at the left is an image of the acrylic when it's inside a walk-in oven. And there's some deformation, you can see some sag, but if we were to take it down from the, the ceiling of the oven, it would go back to flat, that's recoverable deformation. Once we heat it past that glass, transfer, uh, glass transition temperature, it sags into a form that's in pure tension. That's the image that you see there on the right. We then took the acrylic out of the oven, disassembled it, dipped it to Spain, and then reassembled. And here you can see that final pavilion. There were two of these shells adjacent to each other. In all, 13 students, one alum, as well as Rob Saro and Keith McKenzie helped with the project. So the acrylic project was a really interesting way to explore what we can do with waste and what we can do with material transformation. What other kinds of transformations can we utilize to generate structure? How about clay cracking? When clay goes from being wet to dry, it shrinks and cracks. This is usually a bad thing. We've seen images of dried riverbeds. Perhaps we've been in the ceramic studio and we're throwing a piece of pottery and it cracks. It's over. But what if we could find a positive in the cracking? What if we could utilize that to generate structure? So in 2016, a team that I worked on put forward this idea. We're going to take clay. We're going to put it in trays. We're going to allow it to dry and crack. We're going to take aluminum. We're going to melt it down pour it into the crack, this is going to form a series of panels. We can take the panels, propagate it into structure, then adjacent to that structure, we can place clay in shallow pools that over the course of the summer can go from wet to dry and crack and cycle through and show visitors to the pavilion how it was made. The pavilion was intended to be temporary, only up for a few months, so afterward all of the components could then go on and live another life. So we were fortunate enough to have won the competition, but now we had five months to actually figure out how we'd go from rendering to reality. So students helped in a wide variety of ways. I was very fortunate that many Mondays, my students would thoughtfully leave me bags of cans outside my door. I also had students that were performing research for me. And here you can see Sayeda Manzor moving very quickly as she's understanding the variables that impact clay cracking. Here you can see this really beautiful black clay that we pulled from a site in Flushing to understand how the initial water content impacted the size of the crack that we're going to cast the aluminum into. Then we teamed with Bruce Lindsay and Scott Thompson, shown here in the bottom left. They're two artists with decades of casting experience, and we worked at a Scott Thompson studio at Grounds for Sculpture in Hamilton, New Jersey. Here they are casting that first prototype. At the bottom right, you get a sense of scale for these panels. Each one's about 10 feet long by about a foot and a half wide. And Lisa Ramsberg is shown there, hunched over the panel using a plasma cutter. So Lisa was the project manager for the project. We had a whole army of volunteers come down from New York and other parts of New Jersey to help post-process the panels. We didn't want there to be sharp edges or anyone to hurt themselves once we installed. So we pulled one last all-nighter, drove this thing up to Governor's Island in, in New York. We had to take a ferry to get there. And then we did the final installation in 36 hours. A number of our students were on site that day and then came back on opening day with their families for a really fun celebration. And here's the final structure. So we are on Governor's Island. You can see One World Trade Center in the background, as well as the Staten Island ferry. This is the view from above. This is the vandal load, but I'll take in here in the service of getting the photograph, showing the juxtaposition of the cracked clay and the aluminum. In all, 11 Hofstra students worked on the project. And again, Rob and Keith in the shop helped out as well. We have fantastic staff, we have fantastic students, and the students are really interested in how we can build and how research and design intersect on the way to build. They want to learn through making. And they also really want to help people. So this semester we started an Engineers in Action Club on campus. The focus is to design and construct suspended footbridges like the one that you see here. Next summer, so summer 2022, two students are going to travel to Bolivia and construct a bridge like the one you see here. And through these projects, they become role models. We're now gracing the covers of magazines, and they're demonstrating that building is a creative endeavor that encourages curiosity no matter your age. So thanks so much for your time and attention. And now I'm happy to introduce Associate Dean David Rooney.
see how we can get these things on. Otherwise, it's back to the mask. So if you think of uh, this educational enterprise as a process, uh, we've been hearing something about the throughput. So um, Ted and Nick have talked about the work that the students have done uh, in, uh, in various design projects, research projects. And then after I speak, we'll be hearing some of the output because um, Phil Coniglio, who's going to be speaking after me, is going to also be introducing some of our alumni uh, that's with an A E, two women, the Latinists here. Um, uh, so what what I well, that leaves for me is to talk a little bit about the input. So one of my tasks, or I should say, uh, pleasant tasks, of uh, being an associate dean, uh, working with our excellent admission staff, is to uh, talk to prospective students and their families many many times a year, and uh, uh, I've been. Uh, Noticing, of course, in particular this past year, that the whole issue of mathematics preparedness uh, is, is a major concern to students and their families alike. How am I going to get into an engineering or computer science program and, and, and uh, be able to navigate that first year or two successfully? Because as we all know, in the sciences, calculus uh, is, is the language that uh, so much of our theory and even practice is built on. Granted, if you go out into the working world, you're not going to see an integral or differential equation or anything like that uh, when you're designing something. But in order to understand what it is you're working towards in the design, you have to have gone through the theory that explains what are these physical processes. And mathematics, calculus in particular, is the tool that is most successful and has been for 300 plus years. So math preparedness. That's what I want to devote my three minutes to here. And I see in these conversations with uh, parents and students, uh, potential students, two specific problems that are uh, coming to a point. They're, they're very serious. The pandemic. Many high school seniors I talked to haven't been or hadn't been in a live class for a long time. Uh, and, and, and that has taken a toll on them. So they may even have had a BC calculus course in high school, which we normally would think that's great preparation for our programs. But the way that course is taught wasn't necessarily optimal. And a lot of students are feeling very, very jittery when they come onto a college campus hoping and thinking that they're going to be able to get an engineering or computer science degree. Secondly, we're also dealing with a group of students who come from under-resourced high schools. And this is not just a New York problem, this is a nationwide problem. There are, are high schools where the students don't have available to them anything beyond an, an algebra class. Maybe it's an advanced algebra class, but it's still an al algebra class. And we expect, we uh, assume, that students coming into Hofstra's engineering program and computer science program will have had a strong pre-calculus background. In other words, they'll know trigonometry. And that's sometimes not the case. So how do you deal with that problem? You've got students coming from under-resourced high schools. You've got students who've been learning online or sort of learning online for 18 months. What do you do when these people want to become engineers or computer scientists? Well, there's really two potential remedies. And, and um, it seems almost like the first one is the easy way out. But um, I was reading about a program at the University of Michigan it's a robotics engineering degree. Now, Michigan has probably 45 engineering programs, um, the entire gamut. We have our six uh, monster school. So they can do what they want. Um, and what they've done with this BS robotics engineering program, is they said, OK, this is an engineering degree, but we're going to delay the calculus until later on, because what students really need if they want to do robotics is understand algebra. And so they're going to start them out with linear algebra. Now, this program is just starting at, at the University of Michigan. We don't know what, how successful it will be. We don't know whether the other departments are going to adopt it. But it's one way. Uh, and of course, they are getting students from the Detroit area and many other schools uh, in Michigan 
uh, that uh, don't have the facilities that you would like them to have. In fact, a colleague of mine here, David Weissman, and I were just talking to somebody in Michigan uh, last week uh, about a particular program that we're hoping to get involved with. Again, these are things associate deans are tasked with all the time. I've got a hand in about a million programs here. Uh, but um, but what we, our choice, uh, being a smaller school, was we don't want to have these students start at a deficit. We're not going to change the curriculum. But what we can do that Michigan can't do, because Michigan is so big, is we can actually reach out to our students, to those students that I was talking to, uh, to and that I was talking to you about, uh, and, and invite them to take a pre-first semester calculus preparedness course. So we worked on that. We work with the provost's office. We work with our math department. Dr. David Wayne, who teaches in the math department, has a lot of experience teaching both high school and college students. And he had been doing a program during the regular semester for students who are already here to help them get up to speed in, in calculus. And he'd been had very good success with that. So our innovation was this past summer to offer a zero credit bearing, hence zero tuition costing course to any takers among the 225 or so students that were accepted and were planning on coming here so that they could spend four hours a day, four days a week, from August 2nd to August 26th, right before the semester started, uh, working with Dr. Wayne and his band of tutors to learn uh, pre-calculus, in other words, to learn trig, review algebra, to all, the, to all those kinds of things, so that in the fall, they would then be ready to take the calculus course. It was a little bit of an effort to get this done. You deal with the university bureaucracy. How do you get a no-credit course? How do you get students who aren't yet registered as hospital students, et cetera, et cetera. But we got it done, and we offered it for the first time. And uh, we're planning on following up with those students to see how they are doing in their full math courses, how they're doing in the rest of the curriculum. 26, by the way, 26 students signed up for the class. Not all of them finished it. So that's another issue is a free class. So sometimes the incentive to finish a free class just isn't there. But a number of them finished it. And those are the ones we're following up on in particular. So we can do that because we are a small school uh, within a very teaching-oriented university. So, so this is just, I think, an, just a, yet another uh, enterprise that we have started in addition to the ones that um, Ted and Nick spoke about and the ones you're going to he be hearing about from our colleagues in the community computer science department, as well as we're going to be hearing from Phil Coniglio, who is going to talk next about our co-op program, which is one of the real feathers in our cap school. Phil. So good morning, everyone, and a special welcome to Dr. Posner. For those that do not know me, I am the founding co-op director here at the DeMathis School, and it is my pleasure today to talk to you about our wonderful program. To start, I would like to share with you the program's mission, which is to expose our students to real-world experiences, giving them the competitive edge that they need to secure their jobs upon graduation. I'm very happy to say that we are meeting that goal. The, based on the feedback that we get from both our students and our corporate partners, our alumni surveys tell us that over 70% of our students when they graduate are working for our corporate partners. So now let's look at the program by the numbers. In our first six years, we have over 200 corporate partners and had 143 students complete our program. I believe we are at critical mass. Key to keeping our applicants prepared for the co-op, we require them to take a prerequisite professional development course. This course introduces them to the soft skills and business acumen that companies expect students to have before they start their co-op. 
Now let's see where our students are coming from. If you look, if you add up the count, the local counties, you'll see that 65% of the co-ops are coming from New York area counties. This is great news for our corporate partners because it gives them a better chance that they will be successful when they try to hire our students after graduation. So now let's look at the demographics of the companies. Most of them are local have local facilities here in the New York area. Many of them have other offices throughout the United States and internationally. On this slide, you can read what our corporate partners think about the quality of our students and the ease of working with Hofstra. We often hear from them that they think highly of value highly our caliber of our students and that they find it very easy to navigate and find appropriate candidates when using our system. Finally, here is what our students are saying about their co-op experiences. As you can see from their quote, our students are very much enjoying and benefit from them. So now, let me introduce the first of two alumni who are here to share their personal experience. Our first student is Maria Lopez, a bioengineer, class of 2019, and she will be followed by Bernadette Rooney, mechanical engineer, class of 2018. Hi, good morning. My name is Maria Lopez. Um, very uh, nice to have the opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, as mentioned, I, well, I was an international student here at Hofstra who graduated in 2019 with a Bachelor of Engineering in uh, Bioengineering and a concentration in Bioelectronics. Thanks to the co-op program here at Hofstra uh, University, I was able to do a six-month full-time internship at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research during the summer and fall of my junior year. And um, there, I worked at the microfabrication laboratory, which was part of the Center of Bioelectronic Medicine Department. Honestly, it was during this time, this co-op season, that I would consider like my biggest time of growth. And this was because um, the work I was doing was in design, fabrication, integration, validation, and implementation, implantation of uh, neurological devices in preclinical trials for the treatment of autoimmune diseases uh, through vagus nerve stimulation. And yes, this sounds like a lot, and you can imagine how I felt on my first day at work. Um, I was pretty nervous, uh, but like I mentioned, it was during this time when I, where I actually grew as an engineer. Uh, I was able to you know, uh, learn about topics that used to be unknown to me. I also like, had the opportunity to put into practice all the engineering skills and everything I had learned during my time here at Hofstra. I was able to demonstrate leadership and also learn a lot from my peers at Feinstein uh, through you know, conferences, conversations, and just uh, talking to multiple professionals. Uh, I gotta say that uh, I think the most important thing was that I learned what I was passionate about. And I discovered that I was very passionate about neuroscience and product development. And that's what led into me taking the decisions for the next steps in my career. Once I graduated or I finished the co-op program, I remained with Feinstein uh, as a part-time employee for the upcoming uh, semesters and then full-time employee in the summer. And uh, in 2019, as mentioned, I graduated Hofstra and also left Feinstein. Uh, then uh, I pursued my master's of science in biomedical engineering uh, with a concentration in neuroengineering this time at Columbia University in New York City. And uh, yes, this program was held during very inconvenient and unfamiliar times, right, during a whole COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but the truth is that uh, regardless of that, I had learned a lot from my uh, co-op program. And so I had um, developed soft skills that allowed me to engage, even in a virtual environment, um, in conferences and talks uh, with multiple people. Uh, which helped me, you know, um, to get where I am today at my current job. I am an R&D engineer in a startup company in New York City, developing uh, wearable technologies for mental health and addiction. 
And so, um, like I mentioned before, I believe that it is the series of events and experiences uh, that came from the COA program, from the engineering department in general, that has led uh, to make me the passionate you know, uh, engineer that I am today, that it's always really expectant of what's coming next in the field and what can I do to help improve the medical field. And so it is my pleasure to be here and share this with you guys. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Bernadette Rooney. I entered Hofstra in fall 2014 as a mechanical engineering major. I learned a lot in my coursework, but I particularly enjoyed the opportunity to work on projects with several faculty in the areas of structural vibrations and robotics. As I entered my senior year, I began to see all the career options opening in front of me. I realized that the co-op program that Mr. Coniglio had created a few years earlier would be an excellent way for exploring these options. So I enrolled in the program in fall of 2017. He sent my resume out to the mechanical firms on his register roster of co-op partners, and I received multiple interviews and offers. I chose to go with Lazardo's Engineering Associates in Mineola, a medium-sized consulting company that specializes in the design of commercial building environments through the mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems, and architectural design. On the job, I honed my skills and became an expert at using 3D computer-aided design, and I was integrated into ongoing projects with senior engineers. When I returned to Hofstra in fall 2018 to complete my degree, I continued at Lizardo's on a part-time basis, and I then joined them full-time in January 2019. My job title is Mechanical Engineer, and over the past three years, I have taken a major role in many projects, including hyperbaric chambers at Huntington Hospital, the renovation of several buildings at the University of Rochester, the hearing and speech facility at Northwell Health, and very close by, the renovated Weller Hall here at Hofstra. I accumulated design experience. I accumulated my design experience, which now qualifies me to take the professional engineering licensure exam next March. Becoming a licensed PE confers added status in one's profession. Being a practicing engineer means using your knowledge of science and technology, in my case, the laws of thermodynamics, heat transfer, and HVAC design, to solve problems in real-world situations to improve people's lives. Every project is unique and comes with technical constraints imposed by building usage and shape, the needs of the people who inhabit it, the, co uh, the cost of equipment and its installation, the relevant codes to be met, met, and the aesthetics of the design. These are the challenges I face every day at work, and I'm typically involved in three or more projects simultaneously, which are the various stages of completion. My experience in the Demandis Co-op program opened the door to this opportunity, and I'm very thankful to Mr. Coniglio for establishing and growing the program, which contributes to the distinctiveness of our school by making a wide range of career paths so accessible. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Krish, who's a chair of our computer science department. Hello, everyone. My name is Krishnan Pillai-Pakamnath. I'm the chair of the computer science department. The department offers undergraduate degrees in cybersecurity, computer engineering, and computer science. We also have graduate programs in cybersecurity, computer science, and data science. The strength of a department lies in its curriculum and its facility. Our computer science and computer engineering programs are ABIT accredited. Our labs and equipment are state of the art. But mostly, the success or failure of an academic department depends on its faculty. And that's where we shine. Each of our 10 full-time faculty members has undergraduate teaching as their primary vocation. But this unparalleled dedication to teaching does not come at the expense of research. My colleagues and I believe that our research informs and energizes our teaching. We have expertise in, a, in theoretical areas, such as computability. 
applied areas such as distributed systems, and cutting edge areas such as cybersecurity and biometrics. I'll now introduce two of my computer science colleagues, beginning with Dr. Gretchen Ostheimer. Dr. Ostheimer received her undergraduate degree in mathematics from Wellesley. After a 10-year detour out of academia, during which time she worked as a systems programmer, she went to Rutgers, where she completed her PhD in mathematics. Prior to joining Hofstra in 1999, she worked at Tufts. Dr. Ostheimer's research work explores the fundamental limits of computation. She asks, what are the things that can be computed with unlimited resources? She also asks, what are the things that can be computed with very few resources? She answers these questions by melding group theory from mathematics with the theory of computation. Her work has merited serious worldwide attention, and she has been invited to prestigious workshops workshops such as the Dogstool Conference. As a teacher, Dr. Ostheimer is an ardent supporter of the cross-pollination of computing and the liberal arts. He believes that computer science students have as much to gain from the liberal arts as the liberal arts students do from computational thinking. In her classes, she emphasizes critical reading, writing, and thinking. She emphasizes teamwork in the form of group work. To me, she is the queen of group work. Next up is Professor Scott Jeffries. Professor Jeffries' association with Hofstra is long and deep. He earned his undergraduate degree in mathematics from Hofstra, during which time he took a number of courses in computer science as well. He earned his master's in math from Adelphi. Over the course of his long stints at Reuters and then at Computer Associates, and finally at HCL America, he rose to senior management positions before he retired. Since then, he has been associated with the cybersecurity organization called the Anti-Malware Testing Standards Organization. He also resumed his association with Hofstra, first as a member of the HCLAS Advisory Board and more recently, as Special Associate Professor and Graduate Director in the Computer Science Department. Professor Jeffries is a frequently sought speaker on current and emerging cybersecurity threats. At this point, I would like to relate an incident pertaining to Professor Jeffries' teaching. You can easily assess the effectiveness of an instructor by polling the students at the end of the semester. I had the opportunity to observe one of Professor Jeffrey's students at the end of his first term at Hofstra. With tears in her eyes, the student handed him a thank you card and said that he had changed her life. Now that's serious impact. I'm proud to be associated with such excellent colleagues as Professors Ostheimer and Jeffries, but our students are the greatest beneficiaries of these outstanding instructors. With these remarks, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ostheimer to talk about. Thank you for your kind words, Chris. Um, welcome, everybody. President Poser, it is a pleasure to welcome you to Hop. This is my 22nd year here. I have a deep debt of gratitude to this place for my career, for my community here, for my students, and for the hundreds of tulips that pop up every spring. Just you wait. I've been asked to speak about the relationship between the liberal arts and computer science here at Hofstra. President Poser, I suspect that you and I had very similar undergraduate training. I graduated from Wellesley in 1979, and you graduated from Swarthmore six years later. I imagine that we have a similar understanding of what constitutes a liberal arts education 
and a similar appreciation for the value that such an education can provide. Here's the first page of my syllabus for Discrete Structures 1. Discrete Structures 1 is the first semester of a year-long math class that's required for incoming computer science majors. The goal of the year is to enable our students to develop the mathematical maturity they will need to handle theoretical computer science. So here are my learning objectives, and notice that here on this first page, I have what I call my liberal arts objectives. And it, I, I'll read this. The most important objectives for this course are those which are common to all computer science courses. To learn to solve unfamiliar problems without being taught how to solve them. To think clearly and analytically. To work cooperatively. To read closely. To write and speak precisely and to reflect on the role of the university and liberal arts education in society. On the second page of my syllabus, I list the computer science objectives. But for me, these discipline-specific discipline goals are secondary. I view mathematics and computer science as a vehicle, a vehicle for teaching reading, writing, analytical thinking, creative problem solving. Perhaps that is my current working definition of what constitutes a liberal arts education an education devoted to the development of these basic What I've come to really appreciate in these decades of teaching computer science here at Hofstra is how well suited computer science is for this purpose. The language of mathematics, which is the language of theoretical computer science, is very dense and very subtle. By replacing the word a by the, for example, a statement which is well known to be true can be changed into a conjecture that has been unsolved for decades. In our first year course here at Hofstra, we use a text which is used in the second year at Tufts, a school with significantly higher admission standards than Hofstra's. One of my primary objectives for the year is for them to be able to read that text by themselves by the time the year is done. Throughout the semester, I break the students into groups with guided questions to help them decipher for themselves just one paragraph from our text. Listening to these students reading, arguing, rereading, and arguing some more, it's easy for me to imagine that I am back in the English class I took in my first semester at Wellesley trying to figure out a poem by Elizabeth Bishop. What's going on in these group, group work sessions? These students are learning to think clearly and analytically, to work cooperatively, to read closely, and to write and speak precisely. And what of this first objective? to learn to solve unfamiliar problems without being taught how to solve them. Solving unfamiliar problems without being taught how to solve them. This is the hallmark of computer science education, from the first year to the fourth year, from theory to subjects which are very applied. In computer science theory, the way I support this objective is to introduce a new topic not with a lecture, but rather with group work, in which the students discover the main theorems themselves. In fact, my overriding objective of teaching is to see if I can create an environment which, through group work and class discussion, all the main ideas come not out of my mouth, but out of theirs. There are no answer keys in my classes, just as there, is not, there are none when they leave college. Our students must learn how to solve unfamiliar problems, situations which there is no authority. How does this emphasis on liberal arts education affect the professional trajectory of our students? I have no data for you. I have a fantasy someday of doing a small pedagogical study in which I track whether taking discrete structures one has a positive impact on student performance in English or history or philosophy, but that's another matter. So instead of presenting data, I would like to focus on some anecdotal evidence that liberal arts training matters. I see the fruits, for example, in what our students are doing in their last year with us here. While, while Hofstra is not as elite an institution, as, while Hofstra is not as elite an institution as ours were, we at Hofstra are nonetheless able to offer our students some of what you and I were privileged to enjoy: small classes, tight departments, and lots of opportunities for independent study and for research, working directly with faculty who are all active in their own research. I have two students, Daniel Dimitian and Tommy Larson, doing research with me and my colleague Bettina Eich at the University of Braunschweig, Germany. Bettina is a leading expert in GAP, an international project to provide software 
help theoretical mathematicians run experiments, experiments which can guide them as they attack long-standing unsolved problems. Daniel and Kami are pursuing our Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Computer Science, our most challenging degree. They worked with me over this summer as part of the Aspire Summer Research Program, and they will continue to work with Bettina and me all year. Their work will form the basis for their undergraduate honors and master's thesis respectively. Daniel and Kami are having to read theoretical math that is aimed at a second year graduate student in mathematics. I cannot emphasize enough how challenging this is. Challenging primarily because of the high level of close reading and analytical thinking required. The goal of the work is to improve the speed and memory usage of programs that Bettina and I have developed together with her PhD student in Germany. By the end of the year, they will have had the experience of working in uncharted territory. I also see the fruits of our liberal arts emphasis here in what is happening to our students on the job market. Google is one of the most prestigious employers for computer science graduates, and their interview process has the reputation of being among the most competitive. Our students are getting more and more interviews at Google. They are getting further in the interview process, and in the last few years, six have been hired. Our students are successfully competing with students from top tier colleges. The students who have interviewed at Google tell me that in these interviews, the interviewer presents them with a problem in theoretical computer science that they have never seen before. And then the interview, interviewer asks them to try to solve it right then and there. It's not like if our students solve it, they get the job, and if they don't solve it, they don't get the job. Rather, the interviewer watches the way they approach the problem, the way they think, the way they communicate. Google employees are not, by and large, solving unsolved problems in theoretical computer science. That is largely the work of computer science professors at universities. So why would Google conduct their interviews this way? Google recognizes that what is important in an employee is not what they know, but what they can learn. For the Google employer, theoretical computer science problems simply offer a context in which to watch a candidate use basic skills, reading, thinking, communicate. The Google employer knows that if the candidate can employ these skills on a problem in theoretical computer science, then he or she can employ them. So thank you. I'm going to now introduce Professor Scott Jeffries. Um, first off, I never speak behind a microphone. Those of you who have ever had me for a class know that I am completely uncomfortable right now because I'm normally moving about the classroom. But there was something else that was equally unsettling to me. When I heard that you started your undergraduate career in fall of 2014 here at the university, I raised my eyebrows because I often like to tell students that I am part of the Hofstra fabric, having started here in fall of 1979. I often tell students that I'll save you the calculation that makes me older than dirt, so don't figure it out. The point is that in my research and my work, I have focused on the business side of what we can bring from our research into the academic institution, having spent the last 15 years working in cybersecurity and 20 years on Wall Street before that. Kirsch often says to me that I am either a curmudgeon or the siren warning bell for the campus because I like to point out the things that we are about to face as a university. And with the thunder happening outside, is there any better backdrop than that to talking about cybersecurity in the upcoming moments? Since the pandemic started, there have been 26 universities that have been severely impacted over the last 18 months by cybersecurity attacks, where their infrastructure has either been partially taken down or the university has been crippled. Most notably, many of you have heard about what took place at the Rensselaer Polytechnic at the end of the May term, last term, where they were attacked and it effectively shut down the university to the point where students were sent home, no final exams. Good news for them, I suppose. The downside in all of this, of course, is that it didn't stop at the periphery of what was happening with final exams. It impacted meal plans, dorm plans, 
medical plans. It impacted all aspects of the university to the point where it took weeks for them to be able to resume some sort of operational level. Across this slide, you'll see universities which have been impacted most notably over that time period, including Howard University, which was shut down just two weeks ago, Stanford's Medical School, for all the technology that Stanford can bring to the table, the University of California at San Francisco, and many, many others. The point is that I wanted to raise colleges and universities with a new word. They're juicy, okay? These are tremendously interesting targets for international adversaries. And the message I want to come across today is where we stand in the crosshairs here at Hofstra University. In fact, what we've seen in my research with the Anti-Malware Testing Standards Organization over the past few years is that ransomware fees have gone from an average of $115,000 just in 2019 to over $300,000 last year for the average business setting. But it doesn't stop there. You see, universities are where the endowments are, and where the endowments are, there's even more prospect for attack. In particular, I point out that the highest fee we've been able to find so far is the University of California at San Francisco, having been crippled with their infrastructure, paid a $1.4 million ransom to a series of hackers to restore their infrastructure. Similarly, we've seen a $500,000 payment made by the University of Utah. This doesn't account for the amount of downtime, student disruption, meal plans, medical plans, and all the ancillary services that a university can provide. The fact is that universities have now become targets for this type of infrastructural attack, and we should expect, not, not hide from it, but expect that at some time in the future, Hofstra itself is going to face this reality. There are economic drivers behind this. You go where the money is. Why did Jesse James rob banks? Because that's where the vault was. As we grow our endowment, as the university becomes more successful, as we continue to ascend up the U.S. News and World, rank, World, US News and World Report's rankings, thanks to incredible investments we're making here at the university, everything from the rebuild of our Weed and uh, Adams Center, to our new building, which is under construction, to the $5 million infrastructure that we've built at our cybersecurity center. All of this infrastructure and investment, great for students and faculty alike, highlights us as a target for having that kind of wealth available to an attack. And the point is, with ransomware as a service now populating all across the globe, it makes it easier and easier to stage these kinds of attacks. So what are the implications for us? In my business world presentations, I always like to leave the crowd with three messages. So given that I've had a chance from 1979 through today to experience probably more presidents here at the university than you have, starting with James Stewart, going through Stuart Rabinowitz, and welcoming President Poser today. The point is, there are three messages I want everybody to remember from this particular discussion. It's not about whether you're aware of phishing attacks. It's not about how you prevent the dark arts from attacking you. It's these three messages. First, we are now seeing a business cycle begin to emerge in these attacks, meaning the attacks are being implanted at universities months before they are being inoculated, before they are being turned on, which means that before the semester, those attack points are being orchestrated in the June and July timeframe for the fall semesters, and they're being orchestrated in December and January in anticipation of the spring semester. Why? Because you inflict the most damage and increase the pain at a university level just before the semester begins as students are returning to campus. Panic is where you get your revenue from. Panic is how you generate dollars if you're on the other side of this rather unethical equation. We can hear that some of these hacker companies have started launching help desks to help universities and businesses to actually pay their fees. And they've been reported to have excellent customer service. There's something fundamentally wrong with the model where we have excellent customer service in these illegal enterprises. But it's the world in which we're living. That's the first message. The second message is that 
Our board, as with a board of any company, should have cybersecurity and the disruption to our business core front and center as a topic at all times. And it's our job as a technical community in assisting Dr. Poser to be sure that that visibility is always available at that level. If we suspect something is wrong on campus, if we're finding phishing attacks ourselves, we can no longer just push it off to the IT department. It's everybody's responsibility in escalating that issue to make sure that Hofstra and its community, its students and its faculty are protected from these types of attacks. Making this a board level visible issue is all of our responsibilities. And then finally, the university itself has to be very conscious of the fact that disaster recovery plans aren't those things that you put down on paper and dust off when the situation happens. We should, as a university, be prepared at any point to have a disaster recovery scenario launched upon us so that we ourselves find out how we react before the system crashes have taken place. For example, what would happen for many of the students here if the bursar's office was suddenly gone for two weeks? Oh yeah, I know you don't have to pay your tuition, I get that point, right? But the point is, what happens if it's gone? What happens if academic records should disappear and you're planning on going on for your master's degree or a future degree elsewhere? These are the critical infrastructure elements that you as students, we as faculty depend on, and only if we would, uh, in a constructive way, remove one by one to see the impact can we actually see how resilient we are as a university. This technique, is known as red team attacking, where an external company comes in and tries to hack you as a friendly observer to tell you where your vulnerabilities are, but that gets into more cybersecurity technology than we have time for today. So there are three key points here for you to remember. And with that, I thank you very much for your time, and I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Rabani for some closing remarks. Dr. Rabani. Thank you. As you can see, this is why I usually just remain quiet and let our wonderful faculty do the talking. I just want to close by telling you that an educational unit can be compared to a symphony orchestra, with each member contributing to production of a harmonious and rich sound that satisfies the audience. You have heard from a sampling of our engineering and computer science faculty and alumni, and I'm sure that you would agree with me that each has much to contribute to the melody. The Dematis School strives to be a fine-tuned assemblage of educators whose mission remains the preparation of our students. This goes beyond fruitful careers through our many and varied industrial partners, as well as in other professions while faculty, students, alumni also remain attentive to the needs of greater human world. We hire faculty who can inspire students, who can share their excitement in the classroom with the students. We teach very tough courses. They are challenging courses. Our students are always acknowledged for being the hardest working students on campus. And is this excitement that our faculty can create in classroom or in the lab is what becomes contagious and is what's responsible for making our students to become future global leaders. Again, thank you for everyone's participation. Thank you for being an amazing audience. I hope you enjoyed this symphony. And I want to open up the last few minutes for questions. Please, preferably students, come up to our microphone. Share with us your name and your school you're in, and we would be delighted to answer any questions you may have on our presentation today. Thank you. Any question from some of our Dean Advisory Board members who are here with us today, Department Industrial Board Advisory members, Officer of faculty, staff, anyone. I hope we weren't that intimidating. And please, there's a microphone right here.
So thank you for inviting me actually to attend this. This was a wonderful event. I welcome you, President, of course, and Phil for the co-op, Sina for all the support that uh, Hofstra has for community and business. Uh, business. So I represent manufacturing, uh, and really, my question is sort of I know the answer, but for the good of everyone here, um, the engagement with corporations I know is critical. Uh, and I want to know how you recommend, again, that we, we get out there more in terms of engaging the students who are behind me, engaging the faculty that are here. Uh, how do we find out a little bit more about what their studies are, what their focuses are, so that we can do this matchmaking? Um, because really, this is a beautiful thing that is happening here, and I'm excited to be part of it. Uh, but again, that, that, that bridge that you're creating between corporate partners and education is so vital. Uh, so I'm curious if you have any other, uh, again, I don't know all who's in, who's in the crowd, but to me that's vital um, to the success of this program. Sure. Thank you. Again, one of the key things we emphasize, we just don't look at ourselves as ivory towers. We make sure what we teach is what industry and those who are going to hire our products, our students, is looking for. That's why we established the Dean Advisory Board and that you're on it. We have Industrial Advisory Board for the, each department. They constantly meet and review what we cover, and we want to make sure that in fields such as computer science, cybersecurity, and engineering, that things are evolving so fast, we are teaching what they're looking for in our graduates. And one of the key things that distinguishes us from other engineering schools, maybe it's because we really are humble beginnings started by being two small departments in College of Art and Sciences at Hofstra, is the focus we place on durable skills. And you saw the elegant speech that my colleague Gretchen gave and importance of that in something that we don't even think about, computer science and the role of liberal arts. We believe that, answering your question directly, this collection of over 200 plus companies we have, which most of them are local, through them, we have been able to obviously share our talents with them and they benefited from it. I think it's now time to get to the next stage and create more conversation with industry to figure out how we can be more fruitful. One of the biggest talents at Hofstra we have is nobody is aware of all the great things we do in our school. And we need to change that and we need your help to do that. Because when our students come and work for you and you realize the math ninjas and the gems we have created, we are hoping that we can get to the next stage and accomplish things that usually other universities and large engineering schools cannot do. State universities with huge engineering classes cannot have these programs. They are not nimble like us. And again, I welcome all of you, the industrial people, to partner with us further and discuss how we can get to the next step. Yes. Yes, Dean, advisory board members are the one asking the questions. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'm not even sure this is a question, but uh, welcome. And uh, I recall many years ago sitting with uh, then President Rabinowitz in a very formative uh, time of the uh, advisory board, and uh, there was a discussion about, um, well, my name is Joe Heaney, excuse me, and I co-chair with Jim Noll and the advisory board of these. And uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the importance of laboratories and the need, uh, and the need to uh, ensure that uh, the BS civil and environmental uh, students got laboratory exposure. We talked a little further about a PE and uh, uh, that's professional engineering. Yeah, well, exactly. And that was the point. I, I had to explain to then President Rabinowitz what a PE was. And he was quite interested to hear about it and why it should be a goal for a young engineer and so on. So uh, as we've moved forward over the past seven years or so, uh, the new building came out, discussion about increasing the number of labs in the building and so on. And uh, I guess maybe I'm asking Tina, but also maybe you. Uh, if that will continue, uh, that that's something that we in the industry side think it's very important for the, for the graduates to have experience in lab. Uh, hopefully, we can continue to grow the number of labs. Again, I prefer not to put our president on the spot. She has only been here for eight weeks. <laughs> uh, 
And also, we are hoping answering your question directly, although our original plan is not materializing and we are not all moving to this new center. But one of the nice things is happening by sharing it with the nursing school. I'm hoping we can create some synergy, both socially, because most of our students are male and theirs are female. But in addition to that, multidisciplinary things. And, but we are also hoping we will get resources to renovate the space that becomes available in Adams and Weed as a result of the vacated space and be able to expand a lot of these laboratories. Great. Uh, Thank you, Professor Kambarova. Again, I think I haven't got this sign yet, but I believe I have two minutes left. I, Paul? Again, Paul is on our uh, industrial advisory board for the computer science department. He's an alumni at Hofstra Computer Science Program, and he's the president of ListNet on Long Island. Yeah, so for uh, people that don't know, ListNet is Long Island Software Technology Network. We're a chamber of commerce for the tech industry here on Long Island. I'm an alum. Uh, I was very interested in what uh, Professor Ostheimer had to say because uh, I came to computer science after a liberal arts degree. And my question is, um, I actually took the uh, career services program at Hofstra and then got a master's at Hofstra. What resources are available for students once they get into computer science engineering and are having a tough time? Because the courses are hard and someone could have a temporary setback. So. What does the school have, or how do you address those students that might need a little bit of help with that? Sure. Chris, may I answer the question? Sure, come on up. Excellent question. So um, it, this is a challenge for not just people who transition from other yeah. areas, like you had done, Paul, but also for our freshmen when they come into the program. Computer science is a brand new discipline for most of them. So we help in two ways. One. It's a strength of Hofstra to begin with, small class sizes. So you're well known to your faculty member. You're, you can address them in person. You're not talking to a, a TA or some, uh, some opaque uh, system. You actually can talk to your professor. But in addition to that, specifically in the computer science department, we have a roster of student tutors. So these are advanced undergraduate and graduate students who are available for almost 40 hours a week in our labs. So you can go up to them and talk to them, especially for foundational courses, which is where most of the difficulties and challenges lie as you transition into the areas. Our, we pick our best and brightest to help the incoming students. And, uh, and I'm proud to say that our students have actually benefited. I'm talking about the freshmen and new students have benefited from this casual but important and vital mentoring that they get from upper level, upperclassmen and graduate students. And that's part of what we do uh, in addition to Hofstra's innate strength of small class sizes and uh, very immediate contact with them. That's great, thank you. thank you. We have time for one final question from Jim Nolan, the co-chair of, of my Dean Advisory Board. Yeah, so, so I, I'd, I'd like to actually not ask a question but address the students. Um, just to, just to give you a perspective, um, I saw, we saw up there there was only one quote from a student who worked at our, my company and worked in wireless research over the last year. But I would encourage the students is to take advantage of co op program. I think, I think the issue that we have is not opportunity, it's supply of students that will make that commitment. So when the resume has come out, and I, I and my team would look at them, we, we, would, we would call people back for interview a half a day, a day later. Some students have already been. So there, there, there definitely is a need for many, many more students to do this. And the, the experience is, 
is is worth it for students. It does it does more for you than that extra exam or getting an extra tenth of a point on your GPA. That experience is invaluable. Some of the cutting edge technologies that you heard about, and in my company, students got to work on AI, machine learning for wireless data structures as as junior and senior students. Computer science. So what I would what I would encourage you is when that time is there, for you to take seriously think about um, becoming part of the co-op. I think it can be life changing. One of the statistics there was seventy percent of the students get jobs. That's with the companies they they uh, interned with. Beyond that, the other students, I'm sure that the the percentage getting jobs in in the companies that they want to be in is probably close is closer to ninety to one hundred. So I would just encourage you to. Seriously consider the program. Thank you. Again, thank you everyone for joining us this morning for the opportunity to showcase our school, my wonderful faculty, our students. And to the students, please approach us when you see us in the hallways. Come to our offices. We are here to serve you. We are here to educate you. And thank you again for taking the time for joining us here. Have a wonderful day.